Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, this is Nick from Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. And I wanted to come to you with a fresh haircut, but I don't have one, so I'm wearing a hat instead. But I thought to take a few moments just to comment on something that I saw last night that struck me as quite odd. So just to set the stage for you, last night I was watching Tim McGrew's, is it Tim? No, I'm sorry, Warren McGrew's live stream and he was having a tim barber and james white debate party type of thing so really what was happening was he was live streaming the debate and people were commenting in the chat and every now and again like during breaks warren would say something but i watched the debate and it was on dynamic omniscience i want to say the resolution was does god know the future perfectly and exhaustively or something like that so Barber is in favor of dynamic omniscience. White is obviously not. White believes that God has an exhaustive, eternal, divine decree where everything has been determined to happen. And he doesn't like the language of determinism or fatalism or anything like that. He says it's a, I forget what he says, it's God's decretal will or it's decretal divine personal relationship something along those lines I, I forget the exact terminology he's using these days but the point is uh, tim barber was arguing in favor of dynamic omniscience james white was arguing against that and i didn't get the impression that white was very well versed with barber or with barber's style or type of argumentation and he seemed to me to be relying really on his prowess as an exegete on his ability just to read and interpret the text and on past debates that he's done with open theists so i don't think i don't think white did very well in this debate and that's saying something because james white is one of the best in the business when it comes to public formal moderated debates it's it's not often that he doesn't do well in a debate having said that i don't think he did well in this debate for a number of reasons it seemed to me that he wasn't fairly representing Barber's view. He also resorted to mockery a lot of the time. You know, he would just mock and ridicule. So we all know those are logical fallacies, right? An appeal to ridicule, that's not an argument in and of itself. And he would kind of straw man the position and, you know, assert things like, okay, so on your view, God is taken by surprise. And now listen, I'm not, I, I don't affirm dynamic omniscience or open theism, but I like to accurately represent people. And I like to understand what it is that somebody believes before I either critique it or affirm it. Right. So I was in the chat and I was just typing out my understanding of what it is. And they were assuring me that I did indeed understand it. So for those who aren't familiar with either open theism or dynamic omniscience, we're, we're going to go with dynamic omniscience, right? It says that God knows all that there is to know. That's the omniscience part of it. It affirms that God is omniscient. God knows everything. He knows all that there is to know. Meaning, the future isn't set because the future hasn't happened. So when they say God doesn't know the future, the understanding is, well, there's nothing for God to know. It hasn't happened yet. So I don't know if Everyone who affirms dynamic omniscience takes a presentist view of time and reality. I don't, I don't know if that's the case, but I believe the gentleman debating last night, and I know that Warren McGrew, they do, meaning that reality is this present moment. There's not a succession of me's in eternity past leading into eternity future. There's, there's not, there's not a, um, 2027 april 3rd 4 52 p.m eastern standard time version of me sitting there doing something forgot to know what's going on no there there's the me right now but they also hold that god knows all possibilities so anything that could happen god is aware of and he'll not be taken by surprise so for example and molinists use an analogy like this as well when they're arguing for middle knowledge and god's um you know god's knowledge of all possibilities right all subjunctives the idea is this say i'm a master chess player 
and I make a move and I know every possible move that you can make in return, right? In response to my move, you can go any number of ways. I know each and every way that you could go. So it doesn't matter which one of those options you choose. I know that you can choose that option. So I'm not taken by surprise when you do it. And not only am I not taken by surprise when you do it, but I already have the counter to that move and so on and so forth for every permutation of the game. So every possible way that the game could go, I'm ready for it. And nothing takes me by surprise because I understand all possibilities and know all possibilities. So that might be my crude explanation for how they view God's possible knowledge or his knowledge of possibilities, I should say. But the point is this, you know, when I, I was typing things into the chat, they were assuring me that I got it. And the idea that God could be taken by surprise, well, that's, that's a straw man of their position. They don't believe that God is surprised by anything, right? They just believe that the future hasn't happened. It's not something that exists. So it's not something for God to know. But if it was something for God to know, then God would know it because God is omniscient and he knows all that there is to know. So I've stated that enough times. That's not what really struck me about this debate. What stood out to me in this debate was White's closing argument. Now, just for the record, I didn't see the entire debate. What I did see, I saw both opening statements. I saw the beginning of White's rebuttal. I saw the cross-examination, and then I saw White's closing statement. So I did not see all of White's rebuttal. I didn't see any of Barber's rebuttal. And I didn't see Barber's closing statement. And I didn't stick around for the audience questions. So, but something jumped out at me in White's closing statement. And I'm going to pull it up and I'm going to play it for us. And he said it and I thought to myself, wow, the very thing that you just asserted I've heard you complain about over the years with reference to other people. And I said to myself, well, that's mighty hypocritical of him. And hypocrisy is not something I would normally attribute to James White. I've never thought him a hypocrite. He's never struck me as that way. Now, there's plenty of things I would attribute to him. You know, I've, I've found him over the last 20 plus years of listening to him and watching him to be arrogant, you know, haughty, uh, at times rude. I think he was rude throughout this debate many times, especially in his, his mockery, but hypocrite. No, you know, that's, that's never been a brush I would have painted him with, but we're going to listen to what he said. And then I'm going to show why I found it to be hypocritical. All right. So let's get into this. I'm going to mute my mic and play James White. Now, one last thing. This is just my timer. I have no notes up here. I did not give pre-written rebuttals or pre-written closings. In fact, I had almost nothing as far as my opening outside of the scriptures. That's because I wanted to interact with what this gentleman was saying as best as I possibly could. And I wanted to do that so that you all could hear the best debate you could hear this evening because you've come out to do that. All right, so notice what he said. He said, this is just my timer. I don't have any notes on my phone. I didn't have a prepared opening statement other than the scriptures I was going to read. I didn't have a prepared closing statement or a prepared uh, response or a rebuttal to anything that he said. He said, and I did this for you so that you could see me interact with everything he said so you could get the best possible debate. Now, why would I find that hypocritical? Well, because it suggests to me that James didn't prepare for this debate. And like I said, he he's operating on his confidence in his ability as an exegete. He's operating in his confidence of Reformed theology and his understanding of an exhaustive divine decree that means God knows the future because God has determined the future, right? And he didn't really seem to care much what Barber would have to say or would say. And even as Barber's saying it, he didn't really, to me, again, you know, this is subjective. I'm one person, <clears throat> but I wasn't the only person watching this live. And if the chat is any indication, I wasn't the only one seeing this stuff. But he didn't really seem to grasp what it was that Barber was arguing. There were several times when he strawmanned him and just mocked. So I find it funny that he's standing up there and he, he's wearing this in a way where he's painting himself as unprepared but proud because 
in his unpreparedness, he's giving you an off the cuff, live, real time interaction with what Tim Barber has to say about the subject. And yet I've heard him in times past complain about this very thing. So let's backtrack in time. Um, let's see. The year is 2009. The date is January 23rd. And this is what James White had to say regarding his debate with Bart Ehrman. Let's take a listen. I'm Bart Ehrman. Uh, so is the argument from authority along those lines. Uh, you would think that if you're the top dog and you have the, the facts on your side, that your argument would be, well, that's impossible because of this fact and this fact and this and this and this, not just a bunch of, uh, uh, well, I'm, I'm just uh, far better known than you are or so on and so forth. But uh, that is pretty much how liberalism uh, views conservatism. Uh, while conservative seminaries, uh, you study what liberals believe and why they believe it, that's not the case in liberal seminaries. You don't uh, spend time, invest time, uh, to worry about these things. And those of you who have followed the debates that I've done in the past, uh, you know that's exactly uh, how uh, Peter Stravinskis treated me. Uh, that's how Barry and Lynn treated me. That's how John Shelby Spong treated me. Uh, it was uh, painfully obvious that uh, Dr. Ehrman had done no particular preparation for this debate. He did not know who I was. He had uh, not even so much, I think, as Googled my name. He didn't know where I lived. Uh, he hadn't read any of my materials, hadn't listened to any of my debates, didn't know what my positions would be at all. Um, and in fact, uh, David Wheaton asked him the night before, what do, you, what do you do to prepare for a debate like this? And he said, well, I don't do anything. This is, this, is, I, this is what I feel. This is what I've done for 25, 30 years. I don't need to do any preparation. And so, uh, so he didn't. And so as a result, he blundered a number of times uh, because he simply either didn't listen carefully enough to what I was saying uh, or, more to the point, um, assumed things that were completely wrong about what I was saying. So the irony to me is this is exactly what White seems to have done in his debate last night with Tim Barber. He says, I, listen, I don't have any notes. I didn't come up here with a pre-written opening. I just have my scriptures. I didn't, I didn't prepare anything for my closing. It doesn't seem, in, in, in the way he interacted with Tim Barber, it doesn't seem that White had done much preparation at all. And just like Ehrman, you know, Ehrman's like, well, this is what I do. You know, I do this 25, 30 years. I've been doing this. And he says, you know, John Shelby Spong and Barry Lynn. I think Barry Lynn might be the other open theist he debated back in the day. I, I've never seen that one or watched it. But those guys and Peter Stravinskis, whom he's going to mention in another clip I'm about to play. These guys just came in. They didn't know who I was, what I'd written, what I'm all about. You know, they didn't do any prep. They just came in ready to debate. Well, that seems like what White is doing here. And for the record, let me just say this. There's there's no rule stating that you must study your opponent. You don't have to read everything your opponent's read. You don't have to watch everything they've recorded or listen to everything that they've recorded. There's not a rule stating that. Now, it would be good to know your opponent and to know where they stand on things in order to be able to anticipate places they might go. That's good. And White generally has done that throughout the years. He read everything Bart Ehrman had ever written. Even the obscure stuff, articles, books, uh, his PhD thesis, all of this type of stuff. He had watched his great courses, lectures, and I remember him working through some of this material. I remember him constantly talking about how much prep he was doing. And yet, in this debate, it doesn't seem that he did that. And at the end of it, he kind of touts that with confidence, saying, I did this for you guys so that you could get the best interaction possible. Okay. but. Let's fast forward a couple of years. Now it's uh, May the 9th, 2011. And again, he's talking about another debate. It, oh. And let's listen to what he has to say. Now listen, this is what you're about to hear is one of the, the classic examples, in my experience, of utter failure as a scholar in a debate. Um, when the other guy has all the facts, he's done all the research, and you've done nothing. And I've been in this, I've been in this boat where I had researched everything the other guy said. I had all of his quotes. He hadn't even looked me up on the Internet or anything else, hadn't read anything I had said. But uh, they still, for some reason, decide to debate. Amazing thing. Um, he so, again, same complaint. He's had this happen many times. People hadn't looked him up. They hadn't researched him. They hadn't done anything. No prep. And then they show up to debate. 
Again, that is what it seems to me that James White did for this one. Now, I'm not familiar with Tim Barber. I don't know what he's written. I don't know if he has a YouTube channel where he's got videos showcasing his positions. I don't know if he's written books. I don't know if he teaches. I don't know anything about the dude. So I don't know what kind of prep White did leading up to this debate. I can only give you my impression from the debate, and it didn't seem like White did any prep. It seemed like White was relying on his knowing what open theism is, his having debated one of the leading open theists 20 years ago or whatever it was, and the fact that, you know, he's a world-renowned apologist who is comfortable going anywhere in the text, and so on and so forth. It doesn't seem as if he prepared specifically for Tim Barber, and then he wants to tell the audience that he didn't, that he didn't come with notes, he didn't come with rebuttals, he didn't come with opening and closing statements. He just came ready to engage whatever this man had to say in the moment, but he engaged it with mockery, straw mans, and sometimes I'm not going to say he never made any point. And truth be told, I'm probably closer to White on this subject than I am to Barber, although I'm really not in White's camp either. But, you know, I don't, I don't know that I could affirm dynamic omniscience, but I do know that I have a basic general understanding of it. And I don't think White properly characterized it during the debate. Now, one more example, because out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. In this case, the three witnesses are James White himself. So we're getting it straight from the horse's mouth. And it's the same complaint that he lodged in the last two clips. All right, let's get into it. I did a debate with Dr. Mitchell, no, 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 Father Peter Stravinskis, who has two earned doctorates from Ivy League schools, was the editor of the Catholic Answer. And Stravinskis came into this debate. Um, well, Chris Arnson will tell you when they first contacted him and said, well, who would I be debating? Uh, James White. Oh, he's harmless. And, uh, he's right. I'm, I'm just a, I'm just a soft, lovable fuzzball. Always have been, but not in debates. And so he hadn't read anything I had written. His opening statement was about dialogues that he had had with Jimmy Swagger. Yeah, that was right down my alley. And it didn't take long for him to realize that he had made a major mistake to take this debate and to prepare or to not prepare in the way that he had. All right. So same charge, you know, here these guys are, they come to me not prepared. They made mistakes in doing so. And I think that was the case last night. I think white recognized that he made a mistake to not have prepared for him, but he held it up as a virtue rather than owning it, you know, no, nobody expects anybody to come up at the end of a debate and say, yeah, I didn't do so well tonight. Um, I think I lost. As we're going to see, White actually does some, some um, damage control after this debate. But my point is this. He chides Ehrman for saying, you know, oh, I'm Bart Ehrman. I don't need to do any prep. I just do what I do because it's all that I've done. I'm used to this. I do this. I debate this. I don't need to know who you are, what your arguments might be. I don't need to be prepared for you in any way because I'm just going to argue what I argue. But I watched that debate years ago when it happened. And White doesn't lose many debates. I think he lost last night. I, I honestly do. And again, I think my position would be closer to White's than it is to Tim Barber's. But I don't think White did well in that debate. When he debated Ehrman, he certainly lost. And the cross-examination, look it up on YouTube, it was, it was brutal. It was really brutal. And here's what happens when you take somebody like White. And listen, again, White is one of the best debaters on the planet. He's done like 200 of these things. He knows his stuff. But the White that prepares for his opponents is better than the White that doesn't. Now, in the case of his debate with Bart Ehrman... All the prep in the world wouldn't have helped him for this simple reason. Ehrman is a specialist, and they debated Ehrman's specialty. I'm going to say that again. Ehrman is a specialist, and they debated Ehrman's specialty. White is more of a generalist, right? He's an apologist first. He knows a lot about a lot, but 
nothing in painstaking detail. So listen, he can sit down and talk to a Muslim and have a debate with a Muslim and defend certain propositions against a Muslim, but he doesn't have the Sam Shamoon type of knowledge of Islam to be able to go so super in depth and really dismantle them the way that Shamoon can, right? Likewise, White has a pretty good understanding of textual criticism. He can read a textual apparatus. I believe he said that he's collated a manuscript before, but he hasn't done a lot of manuscript collation, right? He hasn't dealt with the manuscripts themselves. He hasn't um, interacted with the best textual critics in the world, and he's not well-versed in the entire field in the way that a specialist would be which in that case was Bart Ehrman. So just by way of analogy, right? You got this, this YouTube kid, Jake Paul, doing all these boxing matches. Now, Paul's, he's a pretty good boxer. Like he, he can really actually box, but all he does is train boxing. And that's all he's ever done since he started. But who's he fighting? Is he fighting a bunch of boxers? Has he gone into the WBC or any of that? Well, no, he hasn't. Why? Because if he were to get into the ring with people who train just boxing and they've been training it longer and they've been fighting real fights, he's going to get beat up. But who does he get in the ring with? Well, I think one of his first fights was like a basketball player, right? But then he gets in with like washed up UFC fighters. Now, some of them were really good in their day, but they're UFC fighters. They're not boxers. So if you're fighting MMA, you're training multiple things. You're generally good at all of them but you're never going to be as good as somebody who specializes in just one of them and that's what happens so you get these mma guys in there and you know if if it was an mma fight they'd submit him in a second they'd leg kick him to death but because it's boxing and they don't just train boxing they're getting beat by a guy who does just train boxing but that's my point when you, when you have a, a specialist they're always going to be better in their specialty than a generalist who's pretty good in a lot of different areas. So White's pretty good in a lot of different areas. Now, I don't know if Tim Barber is a specialist with dynamic omniscience. I don't know. If, I, I don't know anything about him. Like I said, what I do know is that I think White went in feeling like Ehrman, very confident in his abilities and his knowledge of the subject from times past that he didn't do any specific prep for this gentleman. And it showed. All right, let's get on to the damage control. And this was posted by Warren McGrew on YouTube. He took a screenshot of White's tweet or whatever they're called now that it's X. And what did White say? He said, thanks to everyone who came out or watched online tonight's debate. Pretty disappointing on many levels, but hopefully still useful despite that. I will be establishing a new rule for all future debates. Seriously. If you must read your opening statement, fine. However, rebuttals and closing statements should reflect the actual debate as it is taking place. Having your rebuttals and closing statements written out beforehand simply means you're not debating. You're just there to make a presentation that will be interrupted by the other guy once in a while. That's not debating. If you can't listen, take notes, and then interact, most people can't do that, then maybe you should reconsider doing debates. Flowers did it to me twice, Aiken did it twice, and Tim Barber did it tonight. There won't be a twice. It is disrespectful to your opponent, to the topic, and to the audience. Okay, if White had, I don't want to say truth on his side, because again, I, I think White's probably closer to the truth on this than Tim Barber. At least that's where I'm at now. Maybe I could be convinced otherwise, I don't know. But... If White is so confident in his performance, why would he do this type of damage control? Now, again, I watched, he had two debates with Jimmy Aiken. I want to say I watched one of them and then I watched Aiken's review of the other one. So I think I saw Aiken's review of their debate on justification, if I'm not mistaken. And I didn't watch that debate. But from what I remember from Aiken's review, Aiken was basically saying the way the debate proposition was worded, he could affirm it. So it was kind of weird that they were both arguing in the affirmative. 
but I guess White didn't expect for Aiken to be able to affirm the resolution. So he was kind of tripped up in the fact that Aiken wasn't disagreeing more than he did because, you know, White's mind, he should be. And he, you know, he was ill prepared for that. So I guess White's kind of saying, well, you know, he came with all these prepared arguments and he just ran through his stuff. And I definitely watched the other one, which I believe was on Sola Scriptura. And Aiken was prepared. But now the question is this, is it merely you standing up there giving a presentation and not caring about what your opponent said, or is it you doing what White expects a debate opponent to do, which is study your opponent, anticipate their arguments, and have something ready to go for when they make them? Now, I specifically remember Aiken in the Sola Scriptura debate saying, you know, at the end of White's rebuttals or whatever he, he's like look this guy made um a bunch of claims he threw out a bunch of passages of scripture or whatever the case was he was like he knows i can't possibly deal with them all in the time that i have allotted so instead what i'm going to do is continue to make my case and we're going to see how his rebuttals or whatever stand up to the case that i've made now white might disagree with that and say he's copping out and he's just prepared something or one could sit back and say well you know james you did kind of throw like seven things at him and he's only got 10 minutes to respond so you know maybe he could respond to one or maybe he could just do what he said he's going to do continue along making his positive case and see if the seven things you threw at it are enough to take it down let the audience decide so that's that i really didn't see anything wrong with the way aiken did it i didn't see anything wrong with tim barber having anticipated the proof texts and the arguments against his position and being ready for that. Again, White thinks you should be ready for your debate opponent. Until now. Now, all of a sudden, he's got no notes. He's got no closing. He's got this. None of it's written out. And he does that for the audience because they want to see real-time interaction or he wants them to see that. The funny thing is, that, you know, there's a certain irony in this, right? Because he's arguing against a, a presentist and what he's saying is um closing statements should reflect the actual debate as it is taking place whereas the guy he's arguing against was prepared and anticipated what could happen in the future and um he was ready for that so you know there, there's there's something funny about that to me but i say all this to say you know james if it's good for you to critique people for not preparing, then don't sit here and hold it up as a virtue when you're not prepared. Now, I get it. You're a great debater. You usually do your homework. In this instance, it just seemed that you were relying on your skills as an exegete and your confidence in reform theology and your past debates. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. It happens. But rather than say, you know, take your ball and go home because that's what this strikes me as you know it's like you, you're, you're mad you didn't do as well as you thought you would so you're going to pick up your ball and leave and now you you come out with this and you're saying all right we're, we're going to move the goalposts. you either debate the way that i want to debate or you're not debating at all if you want to debate me it's got to be totally off the top off the cuff and you know it's it's got to be debated in a way that it allows me to shine that's that's the gist of this, right? If you're not going to debate me in a way that allows me to shine over you, then you just can't debate me anymore. It's disrespectful to me and it's disrespectful to the audience. And I find that sad and ridiculous. So that's my two cents on the subject. If you watch the debate, drop a comment. Let me know what you thought. Um, yeah, but that's that. Anyway, thanks for watching. God bless. I'll catch you in the next video. Oh, and... Take a moment and subscribe, please. I'm trying to get these subscribers up. Drop a like, share the video, click on the notification bell. I got to start asking for this stuff at the end of every video or maybe the beginning or wherever. But help me out, all right? For those who are already subscribed, thank you for your subscriptions. Pass the news along. Let, let's get these numbers up. Thank you. God bless.